Today I'm going to talk about uh, my dissertation research, which, like I'd mentioned, is, has always been focused on the origins of tempered adapted maze. And so one of the reasons that I'm interested in maze in general um, is that it really does bring together people and biology. Um, so maize is tremendous cultural value for all the peoples of the New World. Um, and the same corn as people comes from the Pueblos, where the people were literally created from the corn, by the corn mothers, and corn is seen as, as something like children. Uh, as such, maize is, besides being a biological or organism, also a cultural artifact. Um, and this is in multiple ways. So one, it tracks human demography. People, corn can only grow where people take it. So uh, this is just an example in the northern and southwest. They were trading turquoise and copper down to Mesoamerica, where they were then bringing back up parrots and cacao. And along these routes, maize also flowed. Um, it also relates to selection pressures. So wherever people moved, they brought their corn with them, and, and the corn then had to adapt to these new environments. Uh, it's also cultural. So an example from our own culture, we really like yield, for example. <laughs> um, and so the, in the last 100 years, we've seen tenfold increases in yield. Um, so one of the reasons that maize I find really interesting is that it really does integrate all of the cultural values and demographic histories of its past people. And this is all within its genome. And so we can use maize to understand people. So maize was domesticated from Teosinte in lowland Mexico. Um, this was specifically from the Teosinte uh, Zia parviglumis, Zia maize parviglumis. And this was in the Rio Balsas River Valley right here. Uh, an interesting thing is that after this, it spread up to the uplands where it got introgressions from another Teosinte species, the upland one, Zia mexicana. Um, and Alberto has been finding that this is adaptive in the tropical land races, so it wasn't, wasn't just doing nothing. Uh, there is also a lot of high diversity in maize that was retained from domestication, unlike many other crop plants. Um, and this is, so basically this is because there was a very minimal domestication bottleneck. Um, we found in a recent paper that it was, it was extremely minimal. And this is seen uh, again in Alberto's data from, from the tropical land races. The 60% of the minor allelic variation is found uh, within, the, uh, within the tropical land races that's also present in Teosinte. Um, so the question is, if I can get this back, how do we have this very tropical grass that was raised in the tropics, domesticated in the tropics, why is it so successful in the temperate regions? How did this come to be? Um, specifically, what is the biological basis for this temperate adaptation? Um, where did the temperate adaptation evolve? Uh, so what, what, did it come out of Mexico or was it de novo in the north? Uh, when did people successfully grow temperate maize? So when in time? And also who was involved? Who were these people? What, what kind of or agriculture, agricultural practices were they using? Um, and then finally, what loci were under selection? So we know that maize first encounters temperate climate uh, in the north, in the southwestern United States, in the box here. Um, and this is just based on geography. This is where you first get really reduced growing seasons, true winter. Um, and the Southwest is really interesting because before you can get to these upland regions where you have true winter, you have to pass through the lowland deserts down here where it's actually quite hot. Um, we know from archeological evidence that uh, maize first appeared in the Southwest around 4,000 years ago and all these sites on this map were actually early, early maize dates and all within really close time periods of each other. Uh, so both in the, in the upland region, also the lowland region. The difference is that in this lowland region, in the deserts, um, you have irrigation canals by 900 years later. So maize took off immediately. Um, whereas in the uplands, it took about 1,500 to 2,000 years before maize really became fully successful. And by successful, I mean that there was increase in processing and storage facilities. So it wasn't just present, but they were actually growing it and processing it themselves. Um, so temperate adaptation is complicated. It involves cold tolerance, involves flowering, and involves photo period. Uh, but we know just from looking at the modern inbred maize from the US that it, uh, flowering time is one of the major contributors. So in the southern US, maize flowers much later than in the northern US. So for this project, I'm going to really focus on flowering time as a proxy for understanding temperate adaptation. Um, we also know that flowering time is, is quantitative, but it's also really highly heritable, which, which helps with this study as well. Okay, so if the main question is how do temperate maize evolve, this is really uh, two, question, two components to this question. So the first is what is the true biological basis of flowering time? What is the functional allelic variation that goes into reducing the days of flowering? And then also if we, if we know that it happened in the southwestern US, we need to know what the demographics of the southwestern maize are so that we understand 
which of these alleles are present and how are they segregating. So to understand this, we have resources, uh, germplasm, phenotypes, and also sequence resources. And we also have some archaeological samples. So um, with the help of these archaeological samples, we can integrate all of the answers to all of these questions to try to understand how adapted was maize at the beginning of temperate agriculture, at least in the north. Um, so just starting with the germplasm and the phenotypes. So the first resource we have is HapMap3. Uh, it's our newest whole genome um, SNP calling that comes from over 12, 1,200 diverse maize samples. And these are both uh, northern or temperate adapted and also tropical. Um, we also have some inbred teosintase and line races as well, so that diversity is also present. We have 2 to 60x whole genome coverage, and this generated 80 million SNPs um, that are, were then imputed, imputed using k-nearest neighbor imputation. So as for populations, we have the NAM populations, which I don't really need to explain to this audience. Um, we actually have three of these. So we have the US NAM, which is split about halfway between temperate and also tropical germplasm. We have the Chinese NAM, which has both temperate and tropical germplasm represented in its parents as well. Uh, and then we also have two EU NAM populations. So these are the two, representing the two European heterotic groups, the dense and the flints. And these are really interesting because half of it comes from northern Canada, essentially, and the other half of it comes from the Caribbean. So we're getting both different lines there as well. Um, these were all multi, uh, phenotyped in multi-environment replicated trials. Um, but these are all, all NAMs, so these are all structured populations. So we also have the AIMS diversity panel for giving uh, more resolution and a little bit more diversity to our, to our modern samples. These are also phenotyped in multiple environments, so we have really good blop estimates for these. Um, we also have a series of outbred land race and teosinte populations that we can use for demographic inference. So the first, we have outbred teosintes. Uh, these are from Jesus Sanchez and spread across Mexico, both teosinte mexicana and also parviglumis. We have a, a sort of a, a balanced sample of land races from across the Americas that were originally chosen by Jeff Rossibarra. Um, and then we finally have a, a concentrated panel that I've assembled from the southwestern United States. And uh, so using these, we can start to understand um, sort of the, the, the modern inference of, of what the southwestern populations look like today. Um, additionally, we have this one, uh, one little population of, of land races, Gaspe Flint, which these are the, the super temperate adapted, the ones that are they're from Quebec. They're very early flowering, so as a reference. Um, okay, so how do we then evaluate something that happened 2,000 years ago? It's, it's not super trivial. So we, have, we can look from the modern. Um, we have population and quantitative genetic inference, and we can use all of these diverse populations, so both the inbred populations and also our outbred populations. Um, but we can also just sequence the genomes of individuals that lived at this time and get a direct estimate <laughs> of what they may have been like. Um, so for this, we have whole genome sequence from Turkey Pen Shelter. Uh, and this is a dry cave in southeastern Utah where the star is firmly in the temperate adapted region. Um, and it spans this period of agricultural adoption. So we have 21 samples. And this is just the stratigraphic column from where they were pulled. They actually all date to within 100 years of each other, and for various reasons, we can't get much finer resolution than that. But it's all right at that period where maize first started to take off in the, in the highlands. Uh, and this was a collaboration with archaeological and ancient DNA specialists. So um, archaeologists at UBC in Canada and also um, at, at the Max Planck Institute, where I'm going after for a postdoc. Um, so, this is amazing sequence data. So 14 of the this 21 samples that we tested have greater than 80% endogenous uh, maize DNA, which is, which is pretty amazing. The mean fragment length is about 65 base pairs, which is kind of comparable to whole genome sequence like, I don't know, seven years ago. Um, and these have also been enzymatically repaired. So in ancient DNA, you get degradation from C to G, but these are actually, it's actually a C, a C to U to G transition. And they now have enzymes that can go in and repair that. So we can even see the transition SNPs. Um, these were sequenced using Illumina uh, protocols, and we have about 5 to 20x coverage on these samples. Um, and then the SNPs were actually called against HEPMAP3 as well. And this is just the distribution of coverage. It's actually a little bit higher than our average coverage for HEPMAP3. So we have, we have pretty good data on this. OK, so how do you evaluate pred prediction? This is just showing uh, a phylogeny of maize. So you have domestication from parviglumis. Took about 4,000 years to become something that looked approximately like modern maize. Um, then you have the spread uh, up into North Mexico and then soon after into the Southwest US. And then around 2,000 years ago, 
uh, you have maize that, that becomes temperate adapted and spreads both north into the rest of the US and also stays in the southwest as the temperate maize. Um, these were not discrete lineages, though. There was admixture between all of these uh, sort of across this time period. Uh, this all changed, uh, and Turkey Pen is sitting here right at this, this juncture between temperate and also then, then the really northern temperate maize. Uh, this all, all changed, though, about 100 years ago with the advent of the inbred lions, of which all of our populations with phenotypes are based on. Um, at this time, you get, uh, you get inbred lions coming out of all of these populations, and, but then you start to get admixture between them, so you get crosses between very tropical material and very temperate material, and that's what we have to look at today. So if we want to predict turkey pen, the good news is that all of our modern phenotypes are um, spanning both sides of it. So although it's still pretty distant, we have, we have both the northern answer and the, the tropical bit that it came from. Um, the other thing is that maybe we can use some of these, these modern land race populations as a proxy for, uh, for, for understanding turkey pen. Um, so the, south, the modern southwestern temperate adapted land races are just as far from the rest of the inbreds as turkey pen is. And so if we can predict those, which we can phenotype because they're still alive today, uh, perhaps we can also predict turkey pen. So I did this, I put together a panel um, of 110 modern Southwest land race hybrids. Uh, this is just an MDS plot showing uh, the distribution of the land races and the asterisks are the parents of these, these uh, hybrid populations. Um, so it's, it's, it's a heterozygous land race individual crossed to a, a single common tester. Uh, and these were evaluated in three different, uh, three different environments with three replicates at each environment. So our germplasm resources then, germplasm resources cover both sides of the temperate adaptation. So we can't see turkey pen, but we do know the answer and we know the, the beginning. Um, our modern populations are pretty well balanced for temperate and tropical. And uh, land race and TOSNT panels give pretty good coverage of the Southwest US and, enough, and sufficient coverage elsewhere that we can perform population inference. Um, we also have the best archeological sequence data to date, which is fun. Um, so we also have phenotypes on a lot of our inbred populations and also on these Southwest land races to validate some of our inference. So as, as for sequence data, uh, both our high coverage data, whole genome sequence data, and low coverage DBS data, both have high levels of missing data, about on average 50% for, e for each. Um, and this is a problem because missing data reduces your power for GWAS and for genomic prediction. So imputation then is just a way to take this low coverage sequence data and Guess some, of, guess some of the missing data in an educated manner. So I developed an algorithm to do this, uh, specifically to use already phased haplotypes, so those present in inbred crop plants. Um, and it uses uh, the relatedness to other individuals to infer the missing genotypes. Um, this is in con the best algorithm for outbred populations is Beagle 4, which I'll reference briefly. Uh, we can also use this to model GBS samples onto whole genome, as whole genome. Um, so fill-in is a two-part algorithm. In the first part, you match inbred segments by shared minor allele to generate higher coverage haplotypes. So like in this example here, this one is heterozygous, so it can't contribute. So you, you only get this one blue one where you have two replicates that come out of it. Um, because you know, if you just have one, you're not going to increase your coverage, so that's not very helpful either. <laughs> um, so then once we have our haplotypes, our higher coverage haplotypes, we can do the same thing and match them based on shared minor allele state with uh, the text that we want to impute. So in this case, this purple one would be matched with this, with this one here. And you can use that to fill in the gaps in the, the genotypes. And you can either impute one individual as an inbred, you can impute two as a recombinant between two inbreds, or impute two as a, um, a heterozygous individual between those two inbred haplotypes. So it's fast and it's um, accurate when you have the haplotype. So basically, it works really well with inbred lines. So in both related and diverse inbreds, uh, we have high imputation accuracy, even at low minor allele frequencies. Um, if we have heterozygous land races, we can't pull out the haplotypes very well and thus can impute with especially high accuracy. Um, it's also really fast, so it scales linearly with taxa. So the reason we wanted to do this was that we had 64,000 GBS samples to, to, to genotype, and it just it, it wouldn't be feasible with something that scaled more quadratically. So the other thing that we can do is also model our low coverage data as whole genome. So instead of generating the donor haplotypes from the data itself, you use the whole genome data as donors. So basically, your, your whole genome HapMap3 samples are your donor haplotypes. 
Um, and then you can match them with minor alleles by block by block to the GBS samples. And then what you end up with is a lot of genotypes. So you end up with 64,000 taxa by 80 million markers. Um, so imputation really allows us to sample more diversity. Uh, by, since we're lowering the genotyping costs, we can, develop, we can devote more to genotyping more samples, uh, which is useful. Um, and really, this works because we have these broad genomic resources. So it's sort of a, a cyclical process where you know, we get more, we do it better, we can do even less and get more samples. Um, also, imputation gives whole genome marker coverage at the cost of GBS, which is, which is especially useful. Um, and 14,000 tax about 80 million markers just equals a lot of genotypes. <laughs> a lot of genotypes to deal with, but also you know, presents opportunities as well. Um, OK, so then what is the biological basis of flowering time? What are the functional loci that contribute? To discover these, uh, we did a meta-analysis uh, for flowering time with about 14,000 taxa overall, but these were separated into seven different families, mostly NAMs, but also the AMS diversity panel and some hybrid populations. Um, traditionally, meta-analysis is done, uh, well, meta-analysis is done as when you analyze these populations separately and then combine them using p-values. Traditionally, it's done using GWAS. The problem is that uh, in our data sets, we have so much diversity and so much structure that only about half the SNPs that are segregating across all the populations are present in any of them. So we just don't have a lot of overlap to compare. Um, even worse, if they are present in all the populations, the allele frequencies are so different between any given population that it's, it just makes traditional meta-analysis very challenging. So to combat this, we thought, well, maybe instead of, if we, if we can't do it across SNPs, we can just do it across re regions. So we can generalize across a region um, and then use that to compare. Um, so to do this, uh, we generate kinship matrices or similarity matrices from subsets of SNPs. Um, and we can use that to uh, detect regions associated with flowering to compare. And so this is just based, based on a, the standard mixed linear model. Um, normally, uh, in your error term here, you just, you just have the error, but if you put in a similarity matrix or a kinship, you can partition the variance associated into the part associated with your similarity or re re relatedness between the taxa and then also the error. So in this case, we'll just have multiple kinship matrices so we can understand how much variance can be associated with a given region as opposed to the similarity as a whole. Um, so there are two ways that we did this. Uh, the first is, is straightforward likelihood ratio test approach. You have one kinship that's targeting the region that you're interested in, and then the other kinship is developed from the SNPs from the rest of the genome as a whole. Uh, you run both the full and reduced model with and without the target region, uh, generate a likelihood, test, likelihood ratio test statistic, and then you can compare that against a mixed chi-square distribution to generate a p-value for meta-analysis. So this generally works pretty well. This is just showing um, the variance explained by any given region. If it has a little red hat, it means it's significant. Um, so this is for the Ames population on chromosome one. We know based on previous data that there probably should be some more. Um, this is even worse if you look at a NAM population where there's extent, extensive linkage to equilibrium. Uh, here we only have one region that's a little bit significant. And part of the problem for this is that if you think about variance explained, it's a function of the LD between your causal polymorphism and the marker you're looking at, um, and also then the estimated effect size. So if you have a lot of linkage disequilibrium uh, in your population, then a lot of uh, the variance is going to be captured by the rest of your genome kinship, just because it's linked, not because even if you, your causal polymorphism is within your target itself. So you basically are losing power. So to combat this, I developed a new uh, method where, in this case, the rest of your genome is just the other nine chromosomes, and you test one chromosome simultaneously iter and iteratively. So in this, you basically, it, in this example, you have five kinships spread across the genome, and they're allowed to vary. So in one, sometimes your kinships can be directly next to each other. Sometimes they can be distantly, distantly apart. Um, so you randomly assign these and run the model against your phenotypes, and you do this over and over and over until you get a minimum of 60x coverage across the genome. Um, and so instead of just running it against the, the main ones, which would be interesting, but we really need a null if we're going to try to generate some sort of uh, p-value out of this. Uh, so for the null, in this case, um, if you run just the other nine chromosomes, basically this accounts for your global population structure. And then in your residual term here, you have both um, the error, but then you also have all of the variance explained by the chromosome you're testing that's not included. 
And so for a null phenotype, you can use the, the real blups, so the, the real population structure, but then scramble the residuals. So scramble the information from the chromosome you're testing. Um, so you run it against those, those null residual or scrambled phenotypes as well. Um, then to interpret it, you basically stack your models on top of each other. You look and okay, 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 so there are three kinships in this region, so this becomes a region. Here there are four, so on and so forth. Those becomes your region of interest. And um, so the kinships there actually have two values. They have a value for your real phenotypes, which forms a distribution. And then they also have a value for your null phenotypes. And so this is actually where you generate significance. So then you can test these two populations against each other in a two population model. I use a Wilcox and sign rank because they're not very normal. Um, and that's how you get significance. So um, if this is just showing instead of just a single heritability, this is actually the mean heritability for all the kinships that cover these positions. If it's, they're more red, they're more significant. Um, but the thing about this is it's not just a total height thing. What you're actually interested in is uh, how different it is from the population structure. So this green line then is showing the mean variance explained by just the population structure using the scrambled residuals. Um, and this is interesting because you get some things that look like they should be peaks and they're not significant and it's just because they're actually just due to population structure generally. Um, we also do get sort of real, uh, real results. So these are known candidates. They show up as very significant. Um, it, it seems to work. Um, so it's interesting if you look at the NAMs where there just isn't that much population structure. Here the thing is though, um, the question is, okay, so like what, what's going on with this? Why is this not significant? And if you look at it a little bit more closely, you can see that it's because the variance explained by that, by that kinship that covers the region really depends on every other kinship uh, in the different models. So if there's one right next to it, it might not explain any significance. If there's one far away, it might capture a lot of significance. And this is because there's extensive linkage to equilibrium within these populations. So really what it's, what it's picking up on is the signal here. And it's whether or not get, that gets sampled. Um, so these approaches are consistent with, but not identical to joint linkage results. So this is just showing, um, these are just the resampling, uh, the probability, or not probabilities, these are just the number of times a SNP was chosen in the model. Um, and so you can see that like here, they're really consistent. Here it's not, um, it's actually shifted a little bit, and, but we already saw there's a lot of LD in the region. So um, the real problem is that uh, if you don't have recombination, you can't get resolution. Even if you have all the SNPs in the genome, you still can't get resolution if you don't have the, the population for it. Um, so this is a little bit better in the Ames diversity panel. Um, so here it's interesting because you can see um, you can see like examples. This is against a, just a straight GWAS, so Manhattan plot behind it, and you can see th uh, that the peaks here are often due to population structure, just sort of as frequently as they're due to a real signal. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, the problem is. It's a little bit of a trade-off. So with GWAS, like you get spurious hits due to population structure, but uh, you have more specificity. So you have a single SNP specificity, whereas in these approaches, you're looking at a region. Um, so the meta-analysis for these approaches is, is straightforward. Uh, you can just use Fisher's method for combining p-values. This is just a plot that shows the highly significant regions and the different populations and the meta-analysis on top. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the thing is, though, what we can do is we have all these different approaches. We have the resampling GWAS uh, joint linkage analysis. We have the two kinship model and the sampling model. And so maybe we can put them all into one model um, and also include other things like recombination frequencies, uh, FSTs between you know, tropical and temperate populations and the minor allele frequencies, and look at them all together and see if we can pick, use all this information to better pick out our SNPs that are, are significant. Um, we can also just this idea of why don't we just run them all in a single GWAS. The problem with this is that um, it's hard, none of, they, they didn't have common environments or genotypes, so the problem is that uh, how do you get the phenotypes lined up against each other? So the way we're currently doing it is if you can uh, predict B73 in any given population and then shift your whole population by the difference between the B73 predicted for that population and the B73 in like a reference. Um, any other, uh, any, if, if anyone has any suggestions for that, I'm, I'm very interested. Um, so we can also ask then, how cross-predictable are these populations? So we'd imagine if they are cross-predictable, they're probably sharing some alleles, and maybe um, it says something about the genetic architecture a little bit of flowering. So to cross-predict, this is just using genome-wide prediction. 
Uh, for this, you take a, you make a kinship of, of two of your populations or all your populations. In this case, like say it's like your orange and your blue population. Um, and this is just using R blup as instantiated in Tassel. So in this case, you mask all of your blue phenotypes, um, and you just t use the associations between your orange phenotypes and the relatedness to predict uh, what your blue individuals would look like based on the orange ones. So then you can line them up against each other. So you have the observed ones uh, on the x-axis that you, that you know but were masked for the model, and then the predictions based on the model. And so then the correlation between these two is your prediction accuracy. Um, so if, if there is cross-predictability, uh, we might be able to surmise that there was a shared functional basis for flowering, which is interesting, but this also just addresses the feasibility of predicting turkey pen. So if we can predict the land race hybrid population, uh, we should be able to predict turkey pen as well. Um, so just looking at this, again, the observed but masked ones are on the bottom. So in this case, NAM is the test set and AIMS is the, the training set. So the predicted phenotypes for NAM based on AIMS are on the y-axis. You can see that for some populations, it works really well. So AIMS is able to predict all of the other populations with high prediction accuracy. Um, some of them, it doesn't work so well. The EUNAM dent is a little bit more, uh, is, a, is kind of a different population and not as related and it doesn't predict as well. Um, sort of interesting that the EUNAM dent and flint, which are the two opposite heterotic groups, uh, don't cross predict uh, at all, which you'd kind of expect. Um, so this also works with low density GBS data as well. So it actually GBS is slightly better than, than the whole genome. So uh, using the GBS data, uh, we can look at whether we can predict the land race parents and the answer is yes, so we can. Um, so both AM, NAM and AIMS predict with high accuracy uh, in the land race hybrid. So we should be able to predict turkey pen. Um, so the question then is, can GWAS help with our prediction accuracy? So uh, if the answer is, is, sort, is maybe, so sometimes. So if we have high prediction accuracy to start, like in the AIMS population, whoop, uh, I did something. Um, in the AIMS population here, you can see that you actually get a decrease in prediction accuracy using both the meta-analysis and then results from three separate populations. Um, whereas if you have low prediction accuracy, like in Chinese NAM to the land race hybrids, you get an increase in prediction accuracy up to like 20, 30%. So um, the good news is if we couldn't predict the land race hybrids, we could probably make it work using our, our flowering time results. Um, sort of interestingly, AIMS, which is our most diverse set, uh, improves the accuracy the most, which makes sense. Okay, so this is the largest public sector panel uh, assembled, both in terms of genotypes and phenotypes. Um, and, uh, and we developed this novel variance approach uh, that's consistent with previously used methods, but it also generates p-values for meta-analysis, which is useful. Um, just the point is that even if we have all the SNPs, uh, we can't increase our resolution if we have limited recombination. There's also significant overlap in our functional loci that distinct populations can cross-predict. So this is good news for prediction in turkey pen. Okay, so what are the demographics then of this southwestern maze? So this is just an MDS plot um, showing where the, the first coordinate is uh, separating teosinte, so these are all teosinte samples, from domesticated maize on the, the left here. Um, the y-axis then separates by geography, so these ones are Andean South American samples. This one here is the Gaspe Flint from Quebec. Uh, and the, the temperate southwest samples are sort of right in here. Um, so, right, okay. Um, so we can also do admixture analysis uh, that basically models our data as descending from some number, some K number of ancestral populations. So admixture is a lot like structure if you're more familiar with that, but it's faster because it uses a maximum likelihood method. Um, and so this is a, a heavily filtered data set. So that was using all the polymorphic SNPs. This is just using about 15,000 um, for 583 individuals. One of the nice things about admixture is it provides error estimates for your different K. So you can see that uh, K equals seven has the lowest error rate. So that's what we're gonna use. Okay, so this is sort of what it looks like when you plot these out. Um, so the ones to the first left here are the progenitor Tiacinte parviglumis. The next ones over are the upland Tiacinte uh, mexicana. And then moving from left to right, you go from South America up through the southwestern US. Um, and these are all ordered by elevation as indicated on the, the bottom here. 
Um, so the interesting thing is if you look at Gaspé Flint, it's almost entirely this dark blue color, uh, which generally indicates that, that that's going to be our temperate component. Um, and it's interesting that the, this temperate component, the first place you really see it is showing up in the middle and lower elevation um, North Mexican populations. And it doesn't actually show up in the highland ones at all. And that's what seems to have become dominant in the Southwest. Um, the other interesting thing is that this, this light blue upland Mexican component uh, is present uh, at, at low levels, but pretty consistent levels in the southwestern U.S. germplasm, but not in Gaspé Flynn. So keep that in mind. Um, so if we look at FSTs or measure of population differentiation, uh, and this is with respect to the temperate Puebloan samples, we can see that uh, they are closest to the desert southwest, followed by this, this middle elevation North Mexican. Um, so it looks like, like the archaeology says, it came from the southwest up into the temperate region, the desert southwest. Um, if we look with respect to the desert, uh, desert southwest material, the closest ones are the Pueblos, followed by these North Mexican middle elevation ones. So it probably it does look like uh, maize probably came up from the middle elevation ones to the lowland deserts and then up to the, the temperate regions. Um, this makes sense if we look at a map. Uh, just by geography, the lowland samples correspond to sort of this green and yellow range, the upland ones to this gray one, and then the middle elevation ones are red. This is the Tucson Basin where maize first showed up in the southwest, and it's pretty much at the same elevation as those middle elevation ones, so that makes good sense. Um, the other interesting thing looking at these, these measures of population differentiation is that um, is if you look at respect to Mexicana, the upland Teosinte, so the ones that are furthest diverged from Mexicana are these, Mex are these lowland samples. Um, and the ones that are closest are these highland samples, which makes sense. And that includes the, the modern temperate southwest material. So it looks like it does have um, it, close proximity to the upland Teosinte. Um, and then the middle elevation ones have sort of middle ranges. OK, so how does turkey pen fit into this? Um, if we look, turkey pen clusters uh, with the southwestern samples. So it's this pink one here, and it's sort of right at the same, same range as the, the blue samples. And it's a little bit shifted towards the Teosinte axis, so it's old. Um, if we look with respect to here, it's, there's the progenitor, there's the upland, here's our gradient from south to north. Um, and if we put t uh, turkey pen into the picture, you can see a couple things. First, that it is modeled as dominantly temperate, so it's mostly this dark blue component. Uh, the other thing is that it has more teosinte, specifically the yellow parviglumus component, um, which again just means that it's old. And the other interesting thing is that this, this light blue upland Mexican component is not present in turkey fen. It's also not present in Gaspe. So. Um, so if we look at with FSTs with respect to turkey fen, it is closest to the Pueblos, so it looks like it followed the same route. So it came out of middle elevation North Mexican into the desert southwest up to the temperate region. Um, the interesting thing, though, is if you look with respect to Mexicana, it has a lowland signature. So the Pueblo here is actually pretty close to the, to the upland Teosinte, whereas Turkey Pens actually has the same kind of signature as the, the, the differentiated lowland samples. So uh, we can see that Turkey Pen is demographically temperate southwestern at 2,000 years ago, probably coming from the middle elevations to the desert and then up. Um, and this is from admixture and FST. But we see that the, the Mexicana introgression is not really important in turkey pen, but it is important later. So we see in all the modern material that the, 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 the upland component is represented. Um, so it looks like what happened is the initial adaptation to turkey pen didn't include that, and then there was a later spread from the uplands of North Mexico into the Southwest. Um, okay, so now we can start to ask the question, now that we have laid the, the, the basis for it, how adapted was maize at the beginning of temperate adaptation? So there are two things we can talk about this. So what is flowering time predicted to be? Sort of this, this main question I've been talking about, using genomic prediction. Um, and then also sort of some stories about what happened at known key genes. And I'm just going to give an example from uh, uh, one of our highest effect flowering time in modern maize, the VGT1 mite insertion. So we are, have already seen that we have good prediction in the unrelated land races. We can predict with high frequency or high accuracy using AIMS. Um, so I just looked at, this is, this is just another way of showing the prediction accuracy from Ames in, to, in the land races. Uh, this is predicted days to thesis on the y-axis. And this is just showing all the land races. If we look at what turkey pen is predicted to be, you can see that it's predicted to be relatively low, so early flowering, um, which is 
cool. It's not the lowest. If we start to split out the, the land races by geography, uh, the lowest ones are actually from the Grand Canyon, the, basically the bottom of the Grand Canyon area. Um, so it could be more, it could be more early adapted, but um, this is interesting because this Colorado River material is the only other southwestern component that doesn't show this, this light blue North Mexican admixture, looking much more like gas bay and much more like turkey pen than, than the other southwestern samples. Um, just then just moving up, it actually, turkey pen is a similar mean to the rest of the temperate adapted southwest, so it looks like it was already reasonably adapted at the time. Um, and then as we move out from so the desert, it's, we get later flowering and then even later and later as we, as we move out. Um, down towards Mexico. Okay, so we can look at the, the also some of these key genes. So the mite insertion of VGT1 is extremely well characterized. It was actually characterized in the Canadian land race, Gas Bay Flint. Um, it confers early flowering by disrupting regulation of, of a known downstream gene. And it's a significant association in most of our modern populations. So is it present in turkey pen? Um, to look at this, it's not present in B73, the reference genome. So I blasted the highly conserved surrounding sequence to look for reads that overlap with the mite insertion. Um, and in doing this, we can see that, yeah, it's actually, it's segregating in turkey pen. Um, so about half the samples have it, about half of them don't. Um, and it has the same sequence as gas bay flint, so it's, it's, the same, it's the same insertion. Okay, so we can also ask the question of where does this come from? Like what population is this variation coming out of? Um, there was actually a paper in 2008 that, that looked at this. So this is looking at the, the frequency of the mite insertion uh, in land races in, across the Americas and in Europe. And you can see that it's present fairly, fairly high frequency in Mexico and the temperate US and then also in Europe. So just to confirm this, I looked at 23 inbred land races to make sure we could see the same patterns. Uh, four of the NAM founders that have the insertion, and then also 18 inbred teosintes to see is this even is this present in teosinte or is this something that came about post domestication? Um, and the answer is that it segregates in the Rio Balsas parviglumis, which is actually not only the progenitor of maize, but it's in the region that was the progenitor of maize. So basically, it looks like it's something uh, that came out of out from the domestication process. Okay, so germplasm at turkey plant generally was mostly adapted at the beginning of this uh, agricultural intensification phase. We get high prediction accuracies in the modern inbreds, which really does also suggest that this germplasm was actually an important contributor to our modern temperate inbred germplasm. Um, and the high effect mite insertion is old and probably pre-domestication. This is not entirely surprising. Everything in maize is old. <laughs> there was very little domestication bottleneck. Um, and often we see that our, our important variation is, is widely spread. Um, okay, so just to, to summarize, uh, we can look at our germplasm and a lot of this inference was enabled with the fact that we do have these diverse germplasm resources and that they were imputed with fill-in. Um, the biological basis of maize shows that there is significant overlap in functional variation to cross-predict populations. Uh, in the southwest, we see maize came from the middle elevations to the lowland deserts uh, before spreading up to turkey pen. And then after the time of turkey pen, there was a later introgression from the highland North Mexico into the Southwest. Um, and so then we can, if we look at turkey pen directly, it was reasonably early flowering, um, and it, this is at least partially from standing variation. Okay, so in the future, Ed already mentioned this, but I'm doing a postdoctoral fellowship at the Max Planck for Developmental Biology in Tübingen, Germany, uh, working with our ancient DNA collaborators. Um, and this is really exciting. Uh, we'll be doing analysis of archeological samples from the center of origin of maize, so from the Tehuacan Valley in Oaxaca. Um, and these are actually like real samples that we're, we're gonna be looking at. So in the beginning, they started out looking tiny like teosinte and they got bigger and bigger until they, they became like maize. Um, so with that, I'm going to say thank you. Uh, so there's been a lot of people, the ancient DNA group, especially Hernan Burbano, Johannes Kraus, and Michael Blake and RG Matson, um, And then everyone in the Bucco lab, especially Peter, Terry, Sinta, and Alberto, and also my uh, Cornell Plant Branding and Genetics for giving me the opportunity to be here and my committee, Ed, Jean-Luc, and Chip. So thank you.